Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Church of Grace. My name is Patrick Hayes, and today is Friday, November 11th, and we are in Matthew chapter 5. This is part 9. That's the ninth time we're getting together. Tonight is to go over the book of Matthew. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we will jump in. Lord, we do love you. As always, uh, Lord, you are so much better to us than we deserve. Lord, we are just grateful that you hear our prayers and we can come to you and we can we can talk to you with difficulties and fears and concerns and needs and things to rejoice over. And Lord, uh, I just want to start by just telling you how how great and powerful, how gracious and merciful you are. God, you are long-suffering to sinners. You are our creator and our savior. You are our provider. And Lord, um, we just want to thank you for this place that we can meet. It is cold outside, but it is warm in here. We have snacks and beverages here. Uh, God, you are just so good to us, and thank you for bringing folks out on a Friday night to get together and study the Bible. Lord, I want to ask you, please forgive me of my shortcomings and my sins. Help me, God, to do your will instead of my own. Lord, please speak through me tonight as we get into the book of Matthew. Lord, we want you here. We want you speaking through me. We want you giving everyone a soft heart and ears to hear from the Word of God. Lord, if you're not part of what we're doing here, uh, we're just wasting our time. Very much we need you here with us. And uh, Lord, we want to ask that uh, you would be with a few friends of mine, um, my friend Matt, he is over in Denver. He was uh, going into surgery for lung cancer today. He got out of that. Uh, it sounded like it was pretty good. Um, Lord, we want to pray, pray that you would be with his family, bring them comfort um, and, and whatever provision they need as they're going through this hard time. And then also my friend Christina, uh, she also uh, went in to have surgery today for cancer as well. And we want to pray that you would comfort her family, have the surgery go well, and God, please um, just bring them through this. And somehow, Lord, we pray that your will would be done and and you would bring people closer to you. And Lord, with that, um, thank you very much for tonight. We love you and we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right. A little bit smaller night tonight in attendance, but that's okay. That means you're going to get called on personally by me with questions more often than usual. And um, I have plenty of time to answer all the questions you guys come up with. So we stopped right at Matthew chapter 9. Or I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 last week. And now we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 and we're going to start in verse 10. Matthew chapter 5 is a pretty long chapter. It's actually got 48 verses, which is why we're probably not going to get through it tonight. So let's read uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 10, 11, and 12. And then as we usually do, we'll just go through the book a verse at a time. Starting in verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So in verse 10, remember, Jesus is explaining this, this whole, the Sermon on the Mount, all three chapters, Jesus is talking to his followers. And he is explaining to them the natural result of being a Christian. And that is that you are going to be persecuted. Again, this is what you signed up for. That's what comes with Christianity. Folks, I'll be honest. If you were to ask me, Patrick, what types of persecution have you dealt with? I would be embarrassed to tell you. Because I have friends that live in countries all over the world who suffer real persecution. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm glad I live in America right now. I'm not running after persecution. But as a Christian, there are going to be people here in America 
that do not like you simply because of your faith in Christ, and they are going to persecute you. Verse 11, there are three things that they will do to you. Jesus says they will revile you. That means they're going to attack you with evil words. They are going to persecute you. That means they're going to harass you. They're going to attempt to inflict unjust punishment and penalty upon you. And it says they are going to falsely accuse you of evil. So they are going to lie about you so another will persecute you. That's going to be your boss or the state or whoever. But somebody is going to lie about you so that you will be persecuted by another. Jesus calls us what when these things happen to us? What does he say? We're blessed. That's the adjective he uses. Jesus calls us blessed when these things happen to us because we are a Christian acting like Christ. Now, remember, notice in here, it says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And in verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness's sake. If we're being persecuted because we're a moron, well, that's our fault. But if we're persecuted simply because someone finds out we're a Christian and they hate Christians, Jesus says, you are blessed. Now, it's not going to feel like you're blessed at the time. Persecution doesn't feel great. Okay, Steve. He tells us in verse 12, at the end of verse 12, he said, for so persecuted they were before you. So what Jesus is saying is that you are now a group that is looked at and admired. You are amongst the ranks of the real believers, the real servants of Christ. So I think that's what it is. The, the blessing, now, don't get me wrong, I'm just I'm going to stick with my with my first answer and not get off into the weeds any further. But that's what I've always looked at it as. One thing I can tell you is that in my life I have had several markers in my life where I met serious resistance. In my faith, I had to make a choice. Am I going to believe A or B? Am I going to go this way or that way? Do you want to know where I received most of the resistance from as a Christian trying to run toward God? Where do you think it came from? It came from Christians. It came from people in churches. That's where most of the resistance came from in my life as a Christian. I got pressure from people to slow down. Don't run after God so hard. You shouldn't believe that. You know, that's a little over the top. That's a, a little crazy. I usually got that from, from Christians. And I'm not saying that that was persecution. But what I will tell you is whenever I ran into some kind of resistance from the world, some form of persecution, whenever I ran into resistance from Christians trying to hold me back from running after God full speed, when I broke through and decided, nope, I don't care what anyone says, I'm going to do what the Bible said, I felt a relief and a peace and a closeness to God that I had never had before. And I had a confidence in my life, knowing that I was doing the right thing, whereas before I was like, oh boy, I wonder if, you know, uh, th this is tough and I'm going against the grain here and so many people are telling me not to do it, um, you know, uh, you're making enemies. So that is what I believe the Lord is talking about. But if anyone else finds something else and has a better idea, I would, I would love to hear it. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, this is the first verse I wrote up here. It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now again, Paul writing to Timothy explains those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There are plenty of Christians out there that live like the devil and no one could tell that they're a Christian. They're not going to suffer much persecution. 
The Bible says again and again and again. Here, Jesus says it in Matthew 5. Paul says it in 2 Timothy. It's all throughout the Bible. When we live godly in Christ Jesus, that's when we're going to suffer the persecution. Okay, verse 12. What is our reaction to this persecution supposed to be? What does verse 12 say? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to rejoice. What else? We're supposed to rejoice and we're supposed to be glad. So get this, folks. You won't just get a reward. <clears throat> well, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. So to rejoice and be glad, again, is not easy. When we get through the next, oh, say 20 verses, we're going to find that everything Jesus is telling us to do and, and calling on us to do is very, very difficult. Rejoicing and being glad when we're persecuted is off, is also very difficult. Believe it or not, that rejoicing and that gladness is part of our testimony. Anyone here ever been in a jail cell? Let me tell you, nobody, or I should say everybody, is complaining. Not one person in there is rejoicing and is glad. But when you find Paul and Silas thrown in a Roman prison, which was way worse than any prison cell I've ever been in, they were singing songs. That shows how different they were from the rest of the world. When the rest of the world ends up in prison, they're not singing. They're not rejoicing. They're not glad. Okay, They're complaining. They're not happy. Now, in verse 12, it says, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So you won't just get a reward. Your reward will be a great one. Now, I don't have time to get off onto a rabbit trail and talk about rewards in heaven because we could do that for the next half hour. But just understand, if there's anything I can tell you, understand this. When we get to heaven, everybody doesn't get the same ribbon for participation. You understand that? That's not how it works. The Bible says we are rewarded for things done in this life. And we will suffer loss as well. There is a judgment when the Christian stands before the Lord entering into heaven. Now, the judgment is not to see if you get into heaven or not. That was covered 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. And when I called upon Jesus for salvation, Romans 10, 13, the blood of Jesus covered my sins. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with me being obedient to God. Am I spending my energy, my effort, my time? Am I using my talents to serve the Lord? Or am I just having fun? Not saying there's something wrong with fun. But remember, the reason God put us here is to find the lost sheep and bring them to Christ. That's the reason we're here. We, every single one of us who is saved, who is going to heaven, is born again because an individual gave them the gospel. That's why we go to heaven. Somebody cared enough about every saved person to come to them and bring the Bible and say, can I show you how to go to heaven? Is it okay if I take five minutes and show you what the Bible says about how to get your sins forgiven and go to heaven? That's what happened. There's not a saved person on earth that did not hear the gospel from the mouth of somebody. Now, maybe they gave you a Bible track and you read it. All right, great. Someone still gave it to you. That's what we're going to get rewards for. Are we serving the Lord in some capacity? Or are we not? Steve, what you got? 100%. 100%. All of the rewards are based on our works. As a matter of... See, you're, you almost got me. You know, I almost took the bait. I almost went down. The, it actually says that in 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5, when it talks about the judgment seat of Christ, it literally says your works will be made manifest. Okay, so you're going to have good works and you're going to have bad works. The good works show up as gold, silver, and precious stone. The bad works show up as wood, hay, and stubble. We pass through a fire. 
again, I don't know what that's going to look like, okay, but the analogy is clear. And when we get to the other side of the fire, the good works that we have done for the Lord are going to remain. Those are our rewards. There's other rewards, but those are some of them. And the wood, hay, and stubble, it's not going to make it through the fire. And there's some people who are going to, they're going to drive through that fire with a uh, U-Haul truck full of gold, silver, and precious stones. And there's other people who are going to have just a tiny little handful of gold, silver, and precious stones, and they're going to have a backpack full of wood, hay, and stubble. They're going to pass through, and they're going to be like, man, what happened? And someone, some wise guy up there, is going to be like, oh, yeah, your life was a joke. That's what happened. You didn't do anything for the Lord your entire life. And we're going to, believe me, we're going to regret it when we get to heaven. This thing is real. And it's, it's for eternity. Now, I'm all for contributing to your 401k. I am. Okay? Max that baby out. But that is not the best investment with the best return. There are eternal rewards. We need to spend our time and we need to throw our treasure at those things. Uh, good question, Steve. All right, let's read Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. This, this, this one's exciting. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Starting in verse 13, what is salt used for? Okay, we got flavor. Um, and as a preserve, preservative, yeah, I ain't even going to try. Okay, we use it to preserve things. <clears throat> An enhancer? What is it? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay, that's where we're going. Okay, so let's start with a preservative, just because that's what I wrote down first, no other reason. As a preservative, salt preserves food from corruption. We as Christians should encourage others to live a pure life. And I don't mean we have to necessarily do this with our words, but that happens when we live a pure and separated lifestyle. Any Christian who lives a pure and separated lifestyle does not fit in with those who are living for the world. That other Christian stands out. And Christians that are living for the world, basically the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all the things that you know uh, our sinful body tends toward and wants, the Christian that is living for those things, for the world, they feel uncomfortable around that Christian that's living a pure and separated life. And just that person living a certain way and having standards, hopefully those standards are biblical standards. We're living a certain way because God said so. Just having those standards, other Christians that are around that pure and separated Christian will feel a conviction and feel pressure to start living that way. And I know that because that happens in my life. Can you believe it? There are Christians holier than Patrick Hayes. There are. And when, yeah, I know. I'll give you a second to recover from that last statement. And when I'm around those Christians, I feel convicted. I see what they're doing. I see the way they're living their life. And I think to myself, you know what? I bet you that God would want me to live that way. So salt preserves. Salt also flavors. 
Good flavor is something that's attractive. It's something we want. When we live a Christian life the way the Bible says to, when we raise our kids the way the Bible says to, and when we, we run our business the way the Bible says to, and we run our finances the way the Bible says to, guess what? Other people notice. If you are a Christian that has been seriously living your life the way the Bible says to the best of your ability, then I guarantee you've had people come to you and ask you about why you do the things the way you do them. Because it's weird. It's different from the way everybody else does them. And they will also see areas of your life that are successful and they'll say, man, I want some of that. The Christian life is attractive. Just like salt flavors food, that's what we want. That is attractive, okay? That good flavor, that good tasting food. The product that the separated, holy lifestyle of a Christian produces, that product is attractive and others want it. Now, do you know that that saying, I don't know how I missed this. Oh. You know that saying, hey buddy, are you here for, hold on, you might be in the wrong spot. Yeah, you got to go upstairs and go through the glass doors in the front of the church. Yep. Oh, I know. Yep, there you go. <laughs> no, that door weighs 200 pounds. There's no way to close it softly. Okay. So when we're talking about, where were we? What were we talking about? Okay, this saying is still in use today. Those people are the salt of the earth. You ever hear that? Right? Okay, that saying is when we're talking about folks who are good, honest, hardworking, you know, reasonable people that we can get along with. The, the good folks that make up these, this country, the salt of the earth. Okay, they are the type of people we all wish there were more of. Again, that is what Jesus wants of us. Let's look at verse 14. This, one, this one's good. When we start talking about light of the world, this one's just wonderful. Okay, verse 14. Light speaks of the outward testimony of good works that points people to God. So our life should demonstrate Messiah and His ways. And by that I mean... If you were unable to speak, people should still notice something different and powerful in your life. It has nothing to do with what you say, has to do with what they see. Now, who is the light of the world? Yeah, read verse 14. Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. You, you here are the light of the world. Now, just like you can't hide a city on a hill during the night, because it's lit up, in the same way, a true Christian will stand out. It will be obvious. There is no way to hide that they are a Christian. Now in verse 15, Jesus is talking about what you can control. You have the ability to hide the source of your light. Hey, sorry, you got to go in the glass doors in the front. Hey, Mac, just go on up there. It's uh, it's getting close to seven. People are coming. Go ahead. Just yeah, just head on up there. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Grab your sweatshirt. Just point everyone to the glass doors. Unless they go to church here, then you can let them in. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we're counting all them in our attendance. Joe, you got a question? Yeah, we do. Okay, here in uh, verse 15. Here in verse 15, Jesus is talking about what you can control. You have the ability to hide the source of your light. You notice that? You don't ever tell people that the light is Jesus. So follow me here. We're going to go to the book of John. We're going to go through three different verses in the book of John. This will help paint the picture. 
John chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So here we read that Jesus is the light. When we get saved, we are supposed to act like Jesus, and then people see that light in us. So Jesus also said in John chapter 9, verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So what does that mean? What does that mean for you good people here today? I'll read it again. John chapter 9, verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So what does that mean for you? Wash? No, no, no. It's not a trick question. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Is Jesus here today? Okay, so what does that mean? Yeah, Jesus is no longer the light of the world. Who is now the light of the world? We are. That's what Jesus was talking about. If you are born again, then Jesus expects you to be the light of the world. Now follow me. There are two parts of our Christianity that Jesus mentions here. First, we have our implicit Christianity. Our implicit Christianity is the way that we behave, the way that our family behaves, the way that we conduct our business and our finances. This is all implicit Christianity. You don't have to say anything. People are going to see these things and they are going to say, you know what? There's something different about this fella. There's something different about this family. There's something different about the way this guy conducts business. There is just something different. They're going to notice. There is, my point is, this is part of the light that Jesus is talking about. And you don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. This is verse 14. I'm sorry, verse 13. Nope, 13 the salt. 14. City on a hill. You cannot hide this. They're all going to see it. Second is our explicit Christianity. That is when we talk about Jesus. That is when we invite folks to church. That is when we give the gospel to people. This is explicit Christianity. We clearly declare to the world that we are a Christian when we do these things. When we are the person that talks about Jesus, talks about the Bible, we're humming that old hymn, old rugged cross, People are like, oh, that guy must be a Christian. Who else do you know that talks about Jesus and the Bible? Nobody other than the Christians. We invite folks to church. Guess what? We are clearly declaring to that person, I am a follower of Christ. And I want you to be my guest to come to church. Explicit Christianity. We're telling everybody. Or we take someone and sit them down and we give them the gospel. Hey, I want to make sure that you go to heaven when you die. Are you 100% sure without any doubt that if you were to die today, heaven's your home? You're not sure? That's okay. I understand. There's no right or wrong answer. But if you're not sure, I would like to take the Bible for 10 minutes and talk to you about it. Would that be okay? We are declaring to the world that we are Christians. Also, light. But you see the difference. Two types of light. Jesus is talking about both forms of light in these four verses. Well, in three verses. One of the verses is about salt, but you, you, you're picking up what I'm putting down. Now, we as a Christian can ruin our testimony and our effectiveness as a Christian if we fail 
in either way. First, if our implicit Christianity is strong and we live a life of a good Christian, that's great. Wonderful. But it doesn't help if we don't exercise our explicit Christianity. We don't talk about Jesus. We don't invite others to church. And we never share the gospel. Guess what we're doing? Taking our candle, putting it under a bushel. We are hiding light. See that? No one can see that light. We put our candlestick under a bushel. We live a good, moral, and separated Christian life, and we never tell anyone why. People are like, man, there's something different about that guy. I wonder what it is. And we never let them know. Oh, guess what? That's an easy answer. It's because I got Jesus. That's why you see all this good stuff in my life. Now, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In this verse, the Christian fails in the second way. Their explicit Christianity is strong. They talk about Jesus. They wear the Christian t-shirt. They invite people to church. They share the gospel. In this verse, people know who your Father in heaven is. That's what it says in verse 16. They know because you've told them. Problem is, you live like the devil. So you got this part down. But over here, you live like the devil and you have none of this part going on. Jesus explains the problem. Look in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. See, you have one group over here. They're doing the good works, but they hide their candle under a bushel. No one knows why of that light. Then you have the other group over here. They know who your Father in heaven is because you won't shut up about them. But you're living like the devil, and Jesus says they need to what? They need to see your good works. Two different ways to fail the Lord. We need both of these if we're going to be a Christian. One does not do it. So, there needs to be a lifestyle that goes along with the explicit Christianity. And with the implicit Christianity, we need to clearly declare who we are and why we have these good things going on in our life. Any questions on Light of the World? Okay, let's read Matthew 17, 18, 19, and 20. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. By the way, folks, you ready for this? Any Christian that lives one of these two parts of their Christian life and not the other, they make the excuse that they're doing so good in this one part that the other part doesn't matter. Anyone that only does one of these two, they all do it. Oh, well, I'm living such a good Christian life, I don't need to share Jesus with anyone. Oh, well, I'm so good at sharing Jesus, I can I can do whatever I want. I don't need to I don't need to be example. It's so easy to make an excuse for our failure because of the one area in our life we're successful in. Okay, let's get back into it. Verse 17. 
Many Christians today ignore or disparage the Old Testament. It happens all over the place. These folks don't get it. Uh, there are some who say, don't bother reading the Old Testament. Others go all the way in the other direction where they believe the law is obligatory and they try to put themselves under the law again. They don't get it either. Uh, the balance is in between the two. Jesus says he is not here to destroy the law and the prophets. The Old Testament plays a role in our lives. The Old Testament plays a role in your life. It plays a role in my life. And uh, it's always such a shame whenever I hear Christians nowadays um, talk down about, disparage, or completely avoid the Old Testament. Now, what Jesus is going to do in the next 19 chapters is he is going to fulfill hundreds of messianic prophecies, but not all of them. Through the rest of the book of Matthew, Jesus is going to fulfill hundreds of messianic prophecies. When does Jesus fulfill the rest? During his second coming. When you go through the entire Bible and you start reading about Jesus fulfilling prophecies about his first and his second coming, do you know what the ratio is? For every one verse in the Bible talking about Messiah coming the first time, as the lamb, as the servant who will be crucified. Guess how many verses there are about a second coming? Moses? There are eight. The ratio is eight to one. John 14, 3, and if I go, I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Jesus said he is coming back. He is coming back, and he is coming back the second time to fulfill the law just like he did the first time. In verse 18, we read about the yacht. The yacht in Hebrew is what we would mistake for uh, an apostrophe. It's a Hebrew character in their alphabet, and we would mistake it for an apostrophe. A tittle is the little uh, diacritical marks that give vowels their sound in the Hebrew language. What Jesus is talking about, the yacht and the tittle, those are equivalent to what we would call the dotting of an I or the placement of a comma. So Jesus explains to us that not one yacht or tittle shall, um, let's see, sorry, I just lost my place. Uh, that's why I turned the page. Uh, shall uh, in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus is calling us to take the text seriously. He's saying none of this is going to go away. It is all important down to the Smallest little character. Do you know that every single time Jesus quotes the Old Testament, every single time in all the Gospels, He considers it to be literal. Every single time He talks about it as if it's a historical event that happened. It is never allegorical. It is never a fable or a fairy tale. He believes that it happened just as it was written. That goes for the creation week in Genesis 1, the ten plagues in Egypt in the days of Moses, and the prophet Jonah and the whale. Every time Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, he talks about it as if it happened. My point is, if Jesus believes this entire book was written by God, how should we view it? you would think that this would be the most important part of our day. Jesus, when he compares this book to something in our life, 
a daily activity. What does he compare it to? Bread. Our daily bread. Every one of us is pretty used to eating every day. And Jesus says this is more important than your daily bread. This is the thing that we should give preeminence to. In our life, we have a book written by God. I mean, don't you think we should read a little bit of that every day? Now, not only does Jesus believe every part of this book was literal, but every single time any author in the book talks about a portion of the Bible, they consider it to be literal as well. Every time Paul quotes from the Old Testament, we hear the, the prophet Daniel read from the book of Jeremiah. He didn't think it was just a neat story. He thought to himself, Jeremiah said, we're going to be out of here in 70 years, and it's almost 70 years gone by. We need to get ready. 70 years comes, guess what? Jews are released from slavery, given provision to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their homeland. Every time someone in the Bible reads from the Bible, they talk about it as if it is literal. My point is, none of it's a fairy tale. Okay, so Jesus Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law, the Old Testament, in three different ways. One, he fulfilled the law through his obedience. And we read about this both in Isaiah 42 and in Hebrews 4.15. Jesus obeyed every single part of the law. He's the only man that's ever done it. And he's the only man that has followed the law, even though he was tempted in all points like we were, he sinned not. Jesus followed the law perfectly. He was the one that was able to complete every single task that God gave us, and he did it all perfectly. So Jesus fulfilled the law in his obedience to it. Jesus also fulfilled the law in his death. <coughs> He met the claims of the law when he died on our behalf. Romans 10.4 explains this. We needed Jesus to die to fulfill the law so that we could be set free from our sin. It was the only way it could happen. And finally, Jesus fulfilled the law in that he gave us the Holy Ghost. Jesus enables believers to receive the Holy Spirit. It would not happen unless Jesus was obedient and fulfilled the law. All right, let's look at verse, uh, verse 19. Now, I'm going to read verse 19 again. I want you to pay attention here. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. How many different people is Jesus talking about here in verse 19? Yeah, that's a common answer. Two different people. He's given us four distinct groups of people listed in this verse. So let's look at who they are. We have one, those who break the commandments in the Bible and teach others to do so. That would mean that there are also those who break commandments in the Bible but do not teach others to do so. Then we have people who obey the commandments in the Bible. Then we have people who obey the commandments in the Bible and teach others to do so. So there are four things that we can be doing and understand there is something worse than sin. What's worse than sin is the condoning of and the encouragement of our sin. God says those people are the worst. That's what He says. Jesus said it, not me. Do not condone your sin. Do not encourage others. 
to do your sin. Just admit you messed up. I shouldn't have done it. That was stupid. That was a sin. It was wrong of me to do it. That's it. Jesus says those that are least in the kingdom of heaven are those that not only sin, but they excuse their sin and they encourage others to do so. Those are the worst. Now, who are the best? The best are not the ones that just obey God. The best are the ones that obey God and they encourage and teach others to do so also. Those are going to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Silent Christianity is not great. Silent Christianity, that's what he says. He says, you obey me and teach others to do so. That's great. I'm not saying obeying God is bad. It's not bad. It's, it's good. It's not great. You want to be great, you got to bring some other folks along with you. I know Christians that will tell me every time they go to a new restaurant that they enjoy. And I've never heard them talk about Jesus. What on earth is that? If we love Jesus so much, you'd think we'd want to tell other people about Him. I'll tell people about a Taco Bell special they have going on. So I need to ask myself, which one am I? We all want to move up to that top rung. We don't just want to obey the commandments in the Bible. We also want to teach others to do so. Our reward is that we will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. All right, now I'm going to try to blow your mind for a second. What commandments are Jesus talking about? Okay, all of them. What do you mean all of them? Be more specific. Steve? He hasn't even taught that yet. <laughs> no, but he's talking about a lot of stuff here. Okay, here, here's what I'm going to give you, okay? I don't, I'm not going to ask any of you to believe what I'm going to tell you. I'm, I'm just going to tell you if you disagree with me, you're wrong. <clears throat> what commandments are Jesus talking about? Jesus is talking about the law of Moses. You want to know how I know that? There is no New Testament at this time. Paul, Saul didn't even get saved and write all those books. The Gospels aren't written yet. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they're not written. None of the New Testament exists. As a matter of fact, every single time Paul goes to a synagogue and preaches Jesus, where was he getting this material? Old Testament. It's all that existed. Ready? That's not even the part that's going to blow your mind yet. That's just the one that's going to get you mad. <laughs> At this point, when Jesus is doing the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, at that time in history, are we in the Old Testament or the New Testament? We are currently in the Old Testament. The New Testament does not start until the death of Messiah. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. This is going to change the way you argue with people on the internet for the rest of your life, Louis. Yes, Sharon. The Mosaic Law? Oh, absolutely. Now, the reason I bring this up 
and I'm bringing this up early in the book of Matthew, is because Jesus is going to make several statements throughout the book of Matthew where everyone's going to say, wait, what? Because it only makes sense if we're under the law of Moses, which they are. Hebrews 9, 16 and 17, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Who is the testator? Jesus. The New Testament, and honestly, the, the, the phrase New Testament and Old Testament is, is a horrible one. If you wanted to say Old Covenant and New Covenant, that's great. You have biblical backing for that. That's Jeremiah chapter 31. Long, long time ago, uh, over 500 years prior to Christ ever coming, uh, we, we read about how there is going to be a new covenant. That If you're not familiar with that, just read uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. It goes over it. And, and it explains how uh, a new covenant is going to come. The Gentiles are going to be brought in. It's going to be different. That's what we are in today. But understand, the New Testament, or if you want to call it the New Covenant, didn't start until Messiah was crucified. This simple fact is the reason many people get confused with some parts of the teaching of Jesus in the Gospels. It doesn't make sense. We are going to read where Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he says, now you all better do what these folks say to do. And you're like, wait, what? Yeah. They were the teachers of the law of Moses. They were the ones you would go to when you had to question about something complicated and how to deal with it. They, Yeah, they were all explicit Christianity. Yes. They had no problem telling you what you were doing wrong. Any questions on that point that I just made? Sharon, give it to me. 100%. Yes, so at that time, sacrifices were still going on. The Levitical priesthood was still in force. The temple was still there. It was only after Christ died on the Passover that the temple is destroyed. And, um, and it was actually at the time that Christ died. Remember, what were the last words that Jesus said when he was on the cross? It is finished. Those were the last words. And the, the, the veil of the temple was ripped. The Holy of Holies, where God abided on the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, it was open for everyone to see. There was no longer a separation. Okay, Jesus died on the cross. The Levitical priesthood, okay, the temple service, all of that done and over with. Now, they continued doing it for another 30, 35 years until the Romans came in and gave them what for. But at that time... The Old Covenant was over, and the New Covenant was in force. Good question. Any others? Okay. Usually you get yelled at when you make such a claim, but it's what the Bible says. All right, let's go on to... Uh, oh, we are still moving on. We, we read through verse 20-something, so let's keep going here. We, we, let's finish verse 20. Okay, verse 20. Let's read this again. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. All right. What was everyone's reaction to that statement? Okay. They were shocked. Absolutely shocked. Why? Because the disciples were around these guys who were the professional law keepers. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, they were the professional law keepers. Now, there are plenty of negative things we can say about the Pharisees. For that matter, we don't even have to make up our own negative things. Jesus takes a chapter and a half just to yell at these guys. But they took the law seriously. None of us can say that they had a feeling of apathy when it came to the law of Moses. 
the Jews took that as the standard. The Pharisees were the ones we aspire to live our life in obedience to the word of God like these guys do. That was the sentiment. And Jesus is saying, you got to beat that to get to heaven. What Jesus was showing the people was that they are a failure in need of a Savior. You cannot get to heaven by your own righteousness. You cannot get to heaven by keeping the law. Turn with me to Romans 3.20 to discuss this subject of the law. In Romans 3.20, we read, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Says it very clearly. Paul, that's almost all Paul talks about in every book that he writes. He writes about how the law is not going to do it. Okay, we cannot be justified by the law. Then he says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So what is the law there for? The law is there to show us our sin. We see that we're sinners only by the law. If it wasn't for the speed limit sign, I would not know that I was doing 25 over. Not only can we not be justified by the law, the law shows us our failure. We look into a mirror. The law is the mirror. We look into that to reveal the truth. After we look into the mirror, it reveals that our face is dirty and needs to be washed. But when we recognize that there is dirt and filth on our face, we recognize that because of the mirror, we do not then take the mirror off the wall and try to clean our face with it. It is there to reveal Only one thing will wash away our sins, and that is blood. The blood that Jesus shed on Calvary. The law is there to show us our failures and our need for a Savior. Okay, let's read Matthew 5, verses 21 through 26, and we're going to get through this in two minutes. We really will. This one's short. Unless you all have questions. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Okay, let's get through this. Verse 21, uh, can we all agree that the law says murder is sin? Any of us have a problem with that? Okay, good. Verse 22, Jesus raises the bar. We are not allowed to be angry without cause or to curse or to call our brother a fool. You would be so lucky as to be under the law of Moses. Because every time Jesus talks about the law of Moses, he raises the bar. Now, when Jesus says, but I say unto you, Jesus is putting himself above Moses. He's saying, this is what Moses said, but what I'm saying, that's some serious talk. 
to Jews listening to this. Verses 23 and 24, loving our neighbor, which includes our family and those in our church. Loving our neighbor needs to be preeminent. Jesus says, before you bring your gift to the altar, you need to do this. In other words, God is saying, it would please God more if you got along with each other than if you brought a gift to God. That's what God's saying here. He says, I want you to all get along. So much so that before you bring me a gift, set your gift down, go make it right with your brother, and then come back. Now what's funny is, God also says, bring the gift. <laughs> That's what he says. Okay, in verse, uh, in verse 24, Leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. <laughs> Verses 25 and 26. Okay, in verse 26, again, he is putting his teaching above the law of Moses. You don't just have to get along with your brother. You need to work things out with your adversary as well. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. We're not going to get any further. We're already, we're about at, at an hour here. We're going to see when we read through the rest of chapter five that a lot of this has to do with how we are to treat other people. Now, later on, we are going to find out when Jesus is questioned, what's the greatest commandment? Okay, good, got it. What's the second? Okay. The second commandment, right? Jesus is defining in these verses how we do that. That's how you love your neighbor. By doing this. It's not easy. But if everybody tries to do it, we can get there. This is the... You got to remember what again what Jesus is doing he is giving us the example of how to treat people so that at any time when you're done you can say hey you know what uh here's a card I'd like to invite you to church after every interaction we have with a human being can we say those words if we can't we failed after every interaction with a human being, we need to be able to tell them, hey, by the way, I'm a Christian and I'd like you to join me at church. Now, when you hold yourself to that standard, which I believe is clearly the one Jesus has given us, all of a sudden it's like, whew, I missed that bar a few times this week. Can we hold ourselves to that bar in traffic? Can we hold ourselves to that bar while commenting on the internet? Can we hold ourselves to that bar when we run into people who are unlovable, who are persecuting us? Remember, this is what you all signed up for. It's what comes with being a Christian. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get out of here. Don't forget, next week, bring a homemade pie or a cunningly disguised store-bought pie. But however you come, please come with some pie. Uh, we will try to run through the rest of chapter five next week and get on to chapter six. So we'll see how that goes. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll skedaddle. Moses, you want to close us in prayer?